great. Okay, everyone, it's time to get started for lecture 12. And we're going to talk today about winds and weather. And it always feels a bit ridiculous talking about this in South California, where there really is no weather. Um, but in some parts of the world, you get weather like this, um, especially difficult to cycle in. Okay, so as a reminder, quiz four, as usual, will be available from 2 p.m. today to 1 p.m. on Monday. It will cover the two lectures from this week, so 11 and today, but also 10 from last Friday. Just one question, um, because we didn't get a chance to, to talk about that last weekend. Um, I've also um, started the midterm evaluation, and I would be really grateful if you could take a, a moment to fill that in. I know you get these all the time, but I am happy to adjust if enough people feel strongly about sort of something that I'm doing, or if you have a suggestion for how I could help you learn, now would be the time to do that, because we still have half of the class left. Um, so please do take a moment to fill that in, um, especially if you've been going to discussion and you have suggestions about that. OK, so I did my magic trick on Wednesday, and we created clouds. I created a cloud in this little bottle simply by changing the temperature. And I changed the temperature by changing the pressure. OK? So what was I actually doing? So remember, we got to this point, which is that to change the temperature of air, we can add energy or remove energy. But actually, we have this second category of process where all we need to do is change the pressure. And if we compress air, it heats up. And if we allow it to expand, it cools down. And so what I was doing with my little bottle was I was pumping air into it to begin with, which compressed it, and that increased the temperature, and that allowed more of our vapor, of our sort of li liquid vapor, to end up in that sort of air in the bottle. And all, all of a sudden, I released that pressure, and when I released that pressure, I went, I just sort of shot straight down. I didn't do anything to the... The, the vapor pressure, all I did was change the temperature by releasing the pressure, and we decreased in pressure, and we hit that red line. We hit saturation. And at that point, you could see it. It started condensing out, forming droplets. We created our cloud, OK? And this is really is the fundamental process for how we create clouds in our atmosphere. Because yes, we can go about cooling things down and warming things up, but also one of the simplest ways we can change air temperature is just by lifting it up or getting it to sink back down. So remember that as we go up in the atmosphere, then our pressure decreases really very quickly. It's why it's difficult to breathe um, at the top of high mountains. So we can change our pressure. We can get it to expand. So if you take a balloon down close to the surface, all of that extra pressure of the air around it keeps it small. But as that balloon moves up, then there's less pressure on the, the walls of that balloon, and so it can expand. And what that does is that when we, whenever we have air moving upwards, that air can expand. OK, so air moving up will expand. And as it expands, it cools. So here we have a six-step um, diagram about how we create our clouds. So to begin with, we have our nice, warm, pretty sort of, uh, we have our nice warm air at the, at the base, at our ground level. And it contains a certain amount of water vapor. And it's probably not saturated at that point. We can still see each other. So it's, there's no condensation happening at that point. But what happens is if we start, if for some reason we can force that air to move upwards, then it's going to rise up and it's going to expand. And because of pretty fundamental laws of physics, the rate at which it cools down as it goes up is pretty set. It's a set value. It's 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So if you go up a mountain, sort of, then it gets colder. And as air moves up, it expands by, and it cools by 10 degrees per kilometer. So you can see that as it goes up, it keeps cooling down, it keeps cooling down. And so on our sort of saturation curve, we're again, we're moving towards that red line. We're getting to the point where we're not changing the amount of vapor in the air. And so we're cooling it down. And eventually, we're going to hit saturation. And that's the point uh, at about 3,000 meters on here. So at that point, when our air becomes saturated, it's at this level here, okay, where we get our bit, the base of our clouds. From that point, we start getting condensation. 
Okay, so the air has become saturated at this little point and when we get condensation. And then something funny happens. Because if we keep lifting that air, then theoretically it should continue to cool down at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer because it's still expanding. But we have something else going on. We have condensation going on. And do you remember that I said that when we change the phase of water, we can release or absorb energy. And the process of condensation is taking all of these sort of fast-moving, free-moving gas molecules and getting them into a liquid. And so they're losing energy from this sort of gas phase until they become a liquid. So that energy is released into the surrounding air. And if we're adding energy to the surrounding air, we're going to warm it up a bit. So now we have two competing processes going on. So now that we have condensation, we have energy being released into the air, which should warm it up. But if we keep lifting it, then it's also trying to expand and cool down. And so what we have, instead of a, a decrease in temperature of 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer, we actually only get a decrease of about 5 or 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer once we have condensation going on. Does that make sense? Because that's a pretty important point. Yes, no, maybe? No, OK, right. So air, if it was completely dry, I could raise air right to the top of that figure. And if there was no water vapor in there, we wouldn't have condensation. It would just keep rising, and it would just keep expanding, and it would just keep cooling down at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. But if we do have water vapor in our air, then at a certain point, when it gets cold enough, the air becomes saturated and we start condensing out droplets of water. And that condensation is taking fast moving gas and, and sort of getting them to stick together as a, a liquid. And so that, those, those sort of individual water vapor atoms need to lose energy. And where does that energy go? It doesn't just disappear, it goes into the surrounding air molecules and it warms them up. Okay, so now as well as our expansion and our cooling at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer, we now have sort of saturation and condensation adding a little bit of energy back in. So we're not going to cool down as fast because for every kilometer we go up, we should cool down by 10 degrees Celsius, but we're now adding a bit of energy back into the system because we have condensation going on. And so it only cools down and maybe at 6 degrees Celsius. We're getting four degrees of extra heat added in by condensation. OK? So have a think through in your head. This is a very good sequence of information to write out, to draw a little diagram about, to have stuck on your wall. Um, rearrange the sentences, see if you can put it in a logical order again. Um, this is the process of cloud formation. So quest first question of the day, where in this photo of our beautiful cloud forming does air reach its dew point temperature? Where does it reach saturation? OK, so let's see if we have an idea. We do. Great. Well done, guys. So absolutely, at B, you can see that's the base of our cloud. That's the point where that rising air has cooled enough that we start getting condensation of, of liquid droplets. And it's the liquid droplets that we see when we're looking at clouds. So below that, at C, our rising air is cooling at that dry adiabatic lapse rate. It's cooling at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. But at B, we cool down enough that we hit saturation. And from that point on, we're only going to be cooling down at the saturated lapse rate, which is 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So we still have expansion, but we also have condensation. Great. OK. So I said if we can force air to lift somehow, so how can we force air to lift? Well, we have four main ways. First of all, we can just force it over a big giant mountain. Okay? And it's one of these reasons why, say, the Central Valley doesn't get as much rainfall as, say, the, the mountains next to it. Because as that air is forced upwards over the mountain, it cools down because it's expanding. And so we reach saturation and we form clouds and rainfall. 
We can also get air rising where we try and force cold air and warm air together. Because what happens is that warm air, more, all of those molecules have more energy, they're more spread out, and so it, it's sort of less dense than that colder air, so it rises above. Just like a hot air balloon will go up, it will end up rising above the cold air, and as it's forced upwards over that cold air, it itself will cool down because it's expanding. Okay. Then we have what we call localized convection, which is pretty small scale, on sort of kilometers or so. And what happens here is just one particular area of your land surface heats up more than the rest, and that heats up the air above it a little bit more than the rest. And so just like our hot air balloon, a little parcel of air will go up. And that's how we get thunderstorms very often. It's just little pockets of air that's warmer than the rest around it, and that goes up and creates little individual thunderstorms. And our last one, which we're going to talk more about today, in the upper left-hand panel, is convergence lifting. And that is where we have low pressure, we have lots of air moving into that low pressure, for a reason we'll come on to in a second, and we can't just keep on piling air into the middle forever. It has to go somewhere. And in this case, if we keep piling air together, it can't go down because we're at the surface. The only place it can go is up. And as it's forced up, it expands and it cools and it forms clouds. So that's why on sort of weather maps and things, if you see an area of low pressure, it's usually associated with clouds and rainfall. So here are some clouds. There are lots of different types of clouds. All I want you to be aware of is that um, they form at different altitudes. And because they form at different altitudes, we end up with different properties and that has actually a really strong influence on our Earth system. And clouds are one of the things that we have relatively little idea of how they're going to affect climate going forward. Um, and there's a specific reason for that, which we're going to talk about now. For now, there are some high clouds, there are some low clouds, there are some that span the range. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons it's difficult to say what's going to happen due to changing clouds is because depending on what type of cloud depends on what effect it's going to have on the Earth. So clouds, first of all, they're nice and white and fluffy, so they're pretty good at reflecting incoming solar radiation. Remember we talked about albedo. They're nice and reflective. But they are also made of lovely water droplets, which are really good at absorbing outgoing terrestrial infrared radiation, our long wave radiation. They act as a greenhouse sort of gas in a way, even though they're, they're liquids. And that's the reason why on a nice sort of cloudy night, it doesn't get as cold. If you compare a nice clear night with a cloudy night, it's often warmer and that's because those clouds are trapping that energy that's trying to escape and be radiated from the earth and it keeps us warmer at night. So, now we come into the more complicated bit. Where we have high clouds, they're not so good. They're usually a little wispy, they have, they're little ice particles. They're not so good at reflecting back incoming radiation, but they are really good at absorbing outgoing radiation. And so high clouds tend to result in warming. Whereas low clouds tend to be that sort of fluffier, thicker type of cloud, and they are much better at preventing incoming solar radiation. They're much better at reflecting back out that incoming radiation, and so they tend to result in a cooling. Okay? So what type of cloud we get in the future will have a great effect on how our climate changes. So everyone's favorite thing, we're going to construct some feedback loops. So let's have a look at one I prepared earlier. Okay, so I'm going to start off by increasing temperature. If I increase global temperature, what do you think I'm going to do to the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere? If you want something to evaporate, will it help if it's warmer or colder? Warmer. So if we increase our global temperature, do you think we're going to get more or less water vapor in our atmosphere? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. And remember, with our saturation vapor pressure graph, the warmer the air was, the more water vapor it could contain before it reached saturation. So if we increase temperature, we're going to increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. What type of arrow is this there for? Normal? Yeah. So we have a big, nice, normal arrow going in this direction. OK. If I increase the amount of water vapor in my atmosphere, what do you know about water vapor that affects global temperature? That might give you a clue. It's a greenhouse gas, right? So if we have more water vapor in the atmosphere, are we going to absorb more or less of the outgoing terrestrial radiation? More, OK. So what type of arrow do I have? I have a normal one. OK. If I'm absorbing more of the outgoing terrestrial ra radiation and keeping it close to the Earth. What am I going to do to global temperature? Come on, guys. You can do it. I know it's Friday. We're going to warm us up. Thank you. So if we increase the amount of outgoing radiation that's absorbed and keeping that energy closer to the Earth, we're going to increase temperature again. Is this a positive or a negative feedback loop? Positive. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So if I increase the amount of water vapor in my, in my atmosphere, do you think we're going to have more or less clouds? We're going to have more clouds. OK. If we have more clouds, what does that do to the amount of absorption of outgoing radiation? Do you remember what I said on a, a, a cloudy night? Is it warmer or colder? It's warmer because that, those clouds are keeping that outgoing terrestrial radiation. They're trapping it and keeping it closer to Earth. So we're also going to increase this. And we already know that if we increase the absorption of outgoing terrestrial radiation, we're going to increase temperature. So is that a positive or a negative feedback loop? Positive. But if I have more clouds, what do I do to albedo? I increase albedo. OK, so if I increase clouds, I increase albedo. I increase the amount that's reflected back. So what do I do to temperature? I decrease temperature, OK? Is that a positive or a negative feedback loop? Negative. OK. So you can start seeing how complicated these relationships are, that we can't just sort of follow necessarily one simple loop around. Because actually, if you remember that now, I have a question to ask, which is, according to that, an increase in clouds will result in an increased global temperature, a decreased global temperature, or um, it's difficult to say. What do you think? More seconds. Okay. <laughs> You're all very certain. I just showed you that we have, let's go back a second. So if I increase our temperature, we have both, if we increase the amount of clouds, OK, we have a positive feedback on temperature, but we also have a negative feedback on temperature. OK, so that's the challenge is that there's two different things. And right now, we can't be certain necessarily which one will win. We're getting better at doing that. But clouds are very, very difficult to put into computer models as well. OK, so right now, it's difficult to say. I'll post a, an, an interesting article to the Facebook group about this because it's a really interesting question. OK, so we have our clouds. But just because it's cloudy doesn't necessarily mean it's going to rain. So what is it that means that some clouds give us rainfall and some don't? Well, it's basically whether our cloud droplets grow big enough. 
So you can see that over here on the left, that little arrow is pointing to a tiny, what we call a condensation nucleus, which is coming back to these ideas of aerosols. So that little condensation nucleus is what condensation can start to occur on. And that can be things like dust or sea salt or other things. And then you can see that our cloud droplets are pretty small. And this arc across the bottom is actually how big our, our droplet would have to grow to before it can start falling out of the sky. Okay? Um, because we've got competing forces of gravity wanting to pull it down, but also just sort of air movement, so updraft, as well as sort of turbulence keeping these things in the atmosphere. So we don't always get clouds when we, or we don't always get rainfall when we get clouds because we need those droplets to grow big enough and sometimes conditions aren't just right for that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about water vapor and stuff. So now we're going to come on to talking about things like temperature, air pressure and wind speed. Okay, so do you remember the solar constant? I'm sure you do because you're all studying it last weekend. I told you that the amount of energy arriving at the top of the, the Earth's atmosphere is the constant. Yeah? And what you should have said to me is, well, hang on, but we experience day and night, we experience seasons, so why do we have a constant amount of energy arriving but different uh, temperatures throughout the year or even day and night? And it's to do with the mechanics of Earth's orbit. And what do I mean by mechanics? I mean the fact that we revolve, as in we spin on our axis. Uh, oh, sorry, revolve around the sun. So we go around the sun every year. We rotate. We rotate on our axis every 24 hours. And our Earth's atmosphere has a tilt. And it's the tilt that is the key to why we have seasons. OK. So first of all, here is our orbit around the sun. You can see that actually it's not completely circular. It's slightly elliptical. And that means that at certain times of the year, we're slightly closer than at others. And in fact, today, we're slightly closer to the sun on January the 4th, and we're slightly further away on July 4th, which is very counterintuitive when we're thinking about it from the northern hemisphere, because it's cold in the summer, right? But that difference doesn't have a huge impact on the seasons it's not the main reason that we have seasons, OK? So yes, it's slightly elliptical, but that's not the reason. We also have our rotation. We spin every 24 hours, OK? And that's why we have day and night. Hopefully, that's not a revelation to anybody. And now I want to talk about tilt. Because tilt messes everything up, OK? And there's three reasons why the tilt, or there's three things that the tilt affects. Um, that causes us to have seasons. First of all, the period of daylight. We all know right now that it's getting darker and darker in the evenings, which is really sad. Um, and in the summer, we have much longer days. Um, things like solar angle and beam spreading. So the angle at which the sun is in the sky, if it's overhead, it's usually warmer than if it's sort of down close to the horizon. Um, and things like atmospheric beam depletion. How much of the atmosphere does that light have to, that radiation have to travel through in order to reach you? How much of it could be sort of reflected off? So first of all, let's look at period of daylight. OK. And it's all very well to look at this in 3D, but, or in these in 2D. So I brought the Earth. It's very pink. But the idea is, is that we are constantly rotating, and we are rotating in this direction, opposite from the way that The Daily Show has it, if you watch The Daily Show, OK? And our tilt, the key thing to remember is that the tilt, which is maybe 23 and a half degrees or something, as we, if I imagine that the sun is in the center of this platform, the tilt is pointing the same way throughout the year, OK? So the angle of the tilt doesn't change. It's always pointing off in that direction as we rotate around the central sun. OK? So what that means is that at this time of year, the North Pole is pointing towards the sun. And as I rotate this, there's no time when that North Pole is not facing the sun. And that's why 
In the summer at the North Pole, you have 24-hour days. Okay? If you think about what's happening at the South Pole at the same time, however much I spin this, it's never going to see the sun in the center of my platform here. And that's the reason that the, North, the, the South Pole has 24-hour nights. Okay? So when it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and here we are at our summer solstice. So this would be June. Okay? As we keep moving around, remember our tilt stays the same. At this point, okay, when I rotate this, everywhere on Earth is receiving the same amount of daylight. We have 12-hour nights and days up here at the North Pole, and we have 12-hour days and nights down here at the South Pole. Okay, it's nice and equitable. As we keep moving round, so we're moving now into December, okay? Now, however much I rotate this, the North Pole is never going to see light from the sun in the center here, okay? It's going to have 24-hour nights. The South Pole, however much I rotate this, it's always going to be in sunlight, and so it's going to have 24-hour days, okay? And then you continue around, and you continue around, and then you get back to, say, March again, when, again, when I rotate this, all of the places on Earth will have the same length of day and night. Okay? So I think it's helpful if you have a beach ball or something at home, you can mess around with this and think about the angle and everything else. So, tell me, which of these letters represents the time when the North Pole will experience 24-hour nights. So look at those. When would the North Pole experience 24-hour nights? Okay, a few more seconds. Okay. So there is a winner, but only just, um, and it is B, okay? Remember that at that time of year, we're over here, however much I spin this, the North Pole is always hidden behind the rest of the Earth. It never sees sunlight. Okay, so it would have 24-hour nights, okay? So, here's just some of those diagrams to represent that. I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, obviously in March and September, we have our equinoxes equal. Everywhere on Earth has 12-hour days and nights. Our June solstice, so summer for us in the Northern Hemisphere, we're pointing towards the sun. Um, and we have much longer days. In our winter, in December, in the northern hemisphere, we're pointing away from the sun, and so we have shorter days and longer nights. Um, and there's a little animation there that treats you like you're about five years old, but it is a really good animation showing this if you'd like to see it again. Okay. So, that was the period of day. And all of these things are interconnected in a way, because if you go back here, you can see that if you look at the sunlight coming in to the Earth here, where the, the sunlight is going to be immediately overhead isn't necessarily at the equator in this diagram. It's actually just to the south of that. That's when the sunlight is going to be coming straight in and hitting the Earth. Okay. And so, if you look at, up at the top, you can see that the sun is going to look really low on the horizon um, as it comes in. And related to that, we have what we call beam spreading. And this is something that you've seen if you have a projector or if you have a flashlight. If you shine the flashlight straight down at one spot, it's going to illuminate that spot really brightly. If I instead shine the flashlight right along the platform, it's producing the same amount of energy at the flashlight, but that energy is now being spread all the way across the platform, and so it's not going to be as bright. 
And it's effectively exactly the same thing when we talk about incoming solar radiation. If the solar radiation is coming straight down, it's going to heat you up a lot more than if that solar radiation is coming in at an angle and being spread over a larger surface of the Earth. Okay? It's the reason why the poles are colder than the equator. And also related to that is that if you have your energy coming directly overhead, it's going to come straight down through the atmosphere and it only has to travel through that sort of thickness of atmosphere. <coughs> if it's coming in from the side, you can see it has to travel through a much greater thickness of the atmosphere to get to us. And you remember that there's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen to that radiation as it travels through the atmosphere. It can be reflected, it can be scattered. And so you know that the best time of day to sunbathe, well, if you want to get burnt, is right in the middle of the day. It's going to be, the sun is more intense there. Okay. So what we end up with is a pattern like this. If we look at all of those three things, then we see that the red shows our nice lots and lots of incoming solar radiation. We call this insulation because we're too lazy to write it all out. Um, and you can see that in the summer hemisphere, there's not really that much of a gradient. Like it's all pretty thick bands of, of orange and red. Whereas in the winter hemisphere, where sort of the blues and the paler colors are, you can see that there's a really big change in the amount of radiation you'd get from the equator to the pole. Okay, there's a much stronger gradient, a much stronger change. Can you guys be quiet, please? Thanks. Okay. And what does that mean? If we get variations at different times of year and in different places of the amount of incoming solar radiation, we get variations in temperature. And variations in temperature result in changes in variations in pressure. And pressure is important when we want to come and talk about winds. And before we move on, I want to talk about pressure. Pressure is equal to force over area. And as anyone knows who's been stood on by one of these things by accident, then if you narrow down your area and apply the same force, then you apply a lot of pressure. Um, and I have to say that meteorologists are very bad at being uh, sort of selective about which um, values of pressures they use. All of these are different ways that we quantify pressure. So all of these are actually the same thing. Okay? We're going to use two particular ones, or that you might see in your textbook, where you're going to use pascals, and sometimes you'll see kilopascals, which just means 1,000 pascals, or millibars. So you'll probably see millibars in discussion next week. Okay? And that's basically what pressure we would measure at the surface today. Okay. So in order to get wind, we need pressure gradients. Okay. And what do I mean by a pressure gradient? I mean that one area has to have a higher pressure and where an area has a lower pressure. OK, give me one minute. Where is my high pressure? Is it inside the balloon or outside the balloon? Inside the balloon. I had to blow really hard to create this high pressure, OK? There's high pressure in the balloon. There's lower pressure outside, OK? What happens if I let this balloon go? Where would air move? Would air rush into the balloon, or would it rush out of the balloon? Yeah. OK. So air is rushing out of the balloon. And that's the key with winds. Air moves from high to low, OK? So winds will always go from high pressure to low pressure. OK. And our pressure gradient is really a measure of how big the difference is between those two areas and over what distance. So if I'd blown the balloon up to this big and let it go, it would have flown really far. If I'd put like two breaths into it and let it go, it would like fizzled out. So the bigger the difference in those pressures, the more wind you get. So this is something you know because you've messed around with balloons, but it's just we're, we're sort of using words to describe that concept now. Okay? So if we have a big difference in pressure over a small distance, then we're going to have a really big pressure gradient, a really steep slope in the amount of pressure we see. 
Whereas if we have a small difference over a very large area, we're going to have a small pressure gradient. And a small pressure gradient means we're not really going to have much wind. Okay. And we use a particular way of drawing that on a map. And I realize now, having not realized last year, that no one ever sees contour maps anymore. Who's seen a contour map in here, like a topographic map? Oh my goodness, I despair. But in general, yes. So what we're going to look at, therefore, is this concept of isobars. So if I were to measure the pressure here at the ground surface, then I would get a certain value. I would measure that pressure, OK? And say if it was 1,000 millibars or something like that. And I could plot that on my map. And then if I got someone else to measure the pressure somewhere else, and they happened to measure 1,000 millibars, then I go, oh, OK. And what we can do is, if you follow the line, those green lines on the map, basically anywhere along that green line, if someone measured the pressure at the ground surface, you would measure that value. So up here we have our 1,020 line, up here, and it runs all the way around here. So anywhere on that line, you'd measure 1,020. Anywhere on this line, you would measure something different. I can't read it right now, OK? Over here, you would measure 980, OK? And you can see that here's 980, here's 1,020. 980 is lower than 1,020. So 980 is our low pressure area. 1,020 oh, is a higher number, it's our high pressure. Okay? So high and low pressure are just what you would measure. It's nothing to do with the gradient. Okay? But what you can see, therefore, is that up here in in various places that these are plotted at four millibar intervals. So this one's at 1,020, this one's at 1,016, this one's at 1,012, et cetera. So you can get a sense of how much the pressure is changing over that distance. So my mean question of the day is, where do you think the biggest pressure gradient, so where would you see the greatest change in pressure over the shortest distance? Where would that be on this map? And then I also want you to think about which way wind would be moving across it. Okay, a few more seconds. <coughs> B, you guys have got it. Okay, so B is the correct answer because you can see that that's where the lines are closest together. So where we have really closely spaced isobars means we have a big change in pressure over a short distance. We're going to have a high pressure gradient, and that's going to mean really strong winds. Where we have something like circled in red, where we have relatively few isobars and they're really widely spaced, then we have a low pressure gradient, and we're going to get relatively gentle winds. Okay. So, what about which way the wind would be moving? Would it be going from the low outwards, or would it be going from outside into the low? Outside the yeah, it would be going from outside into that low pressure. Okay, because remember our winds always go from high to low. So we're going from high to low. So, we've talked about pressure gradients. I now want to talk about the Coriolis effect. And I first of all want to show you 20 seconds of a quick video just to keep you awake and also to show you what happens when you ask a bunch of meteorologists, so people that do this for a living, what happens when you ask them what the Coriolis effect is? Okay, so I wanted to get across the message that this is something that's quite a challenge to first of all explain on my half and also to understand, okay? Don't panic. The main thing is not to panic. I'm going to tell you a really easy way of remembering it um, and that should help, okay? 
And so the idea is, is that, yes, we have these pressure gradients, but these pressure gradients happen on our Earth, which is spinning. And that spin messes things up, OK? So the Coriolis force is this apparent force Okay, which changes the direction of moving objects. Okay? And so here's our Earth, and it's spinning around. And at our equator, you can imagine that if I pick a point on the equator, so here, it has 24 hours to spin around and get back to the same place. Okay? And that means that at the equator where the Earth is wider, it has to travel 40,000 kilometers. If we pick a location closer to one of the poles, down here, for example, and I say, OK, well, this point has to rotate and get back in 24 hours, it only has to travel 20,000 kilometers. And so the speeds at which points on this sort of spinning Earth are moving are slightly different. So here at the equator, it's moving more quickly because it has further to go to get back to its original point. OK? And so what happens is that because of that difference in speed, as you move, I mean, if you know, if you throw things at, from a moving car, it will probably, it actually travels in a straight line, but to you, it looks like it's curving away from you, okay? If someone was to try and throw something to you when you're in the moving car, and they threw it in a straight line, by the time it reached you, you'd be over here somewhere, okay? So it's this curving sort of feature because of this change in speed. And that's all of the math you need to know. I have a link to a more mathematical equations and things like that if people are more mathematically minded. But what I want you to remember is that if you see it, if you look at those arrows, if you look along the direction of the arrow in the southern hemisphere, if I look from going from the pole to the equator, if I'm moving along the arrow, I get deflected to the left. If I'm instead moving from the equator down towards the pole, I still get deflected to the left, okay, but it's in the direction of motion. And in the northern hemisphere, if I'm moving from the equator to the pole, I get deflected to the right. And the same thing, if I'm going from the pole to the equator, I get deflected to the right. So you always have to look along the arrow in the direction that it's going, and then you can look at left and right. And my really stupid saying for remembering this is, I'm from the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm always right, OK? And so that's all you really need to get for this. If you can remember that things get deflected to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and the left in the Southern Hemisphere, you'll be fine. So the strength of the Coriolis force, however, depends on the rotation of the rate of the planet, which isn't changing, so we can ignore that, OK? Latitude, it's zero at the equator, and it's maximum at the poles. But most importantly for us today, the speed of the moving object, OK? If I was to throw, I don't know, a ball at the person at the back, then I wouldn't need to take into account the Coriolis effect. If I was shooting a bullet at the person at the back, I might need to take into account more of it. Not that I would, I promise. OK? And it's something that we have to think about when we fly jets and things around the world. So my challenge for you is, OK, I have a little game here. And what you are, you are this little fighter jet, and you want to rejoin your aircraft carrier. Do you aim here? If you think here, you press A, B, or C. Where would you aim, taking into account the different rotation of the Earth? OK? Oh, hang on. It's not working. So we're in the southern hemisphere. OK, a few more seconds to make your vote. OK, so let's see what people got. Oh, well, it was close, but most people said C. So this one, so let's see if you're right. <laughs> uh, no, 
You died, I'm afraid, okay? So, um, I'm afraid we don't have time to do this more often, but have a go at this and see if you can get it to, to think about this, okay? So this is your challenge for this weekend, is to play around with the game. Okay, I have a couple of things, otherwise you won't be able to do the quiz, so please, please do listen for the last five minutes. So, remember I said that the Coriolis force, the amount of force it, that you feel, depends on friction, uh, on the speed, okay? And you can imagine that down here at the surface, there's lots of things for wind to bump into. It's what we see when we see winds move uh, trees, and if you feel the wind, there's a lot of friction, you are creating friction, and that will slow the wind down. So down here near the surface, we have lots of friction, and so that slows down the wind, and it lessens the Coriolis force. Whereas up high in the atmosphere, then the winds move faster and the Coriolis force is much stronger. And this is important. I'm going to skip this. Um, I'll draw this on Monday for you. But the idea is, is that in the high in the atmosphere, where we can ignore friction, then what happens is that the pressure gradient force, so the, the pressure difference that's driving your wind to begin with, and the Coriolis force balance out. And the key thing to remember is that that means that your winds go parallel to those isobars, okay? So if we look at, say, lots of those little white isobars, the winds are going more or less parallel to those isobars, okay? And so what happens is that, say, in a high-pressure system, as air goes out of that high-pressure system in the northern hemisphere, it's deflected to the right, okay, you can see it goes right. As air moves out of the high pressure in the southern hemisphere, it gets deflected to the left. As air moves into this low pressure system in the southern hemisphere, it gets deflected to the left. As it moves into the low pressure in the northern hemisphere, it gets deflected to the right. Okay, so look along that direction of arrow. That's in the upper atmosphere where we have the wind going parallel to those isobars. Down here at the surface, we have friction, and that slows down the winds, and that lessens our Coriolis force. So instead of balancing out those two forces, our pressure gradient force, the force that's pulling or pushing that wind from high pressure to low pressure, is stronger than the Coriolis force. And what happens is that the wind, therefore, actually goes across those isobars. It goes it does still have this rotation to it, but instead of going around and around and around, it actually does move into that pressure. So this is the difference in the low atmosphere where we have friction and slower winds, the pressure gradient force wins. We still have a little bit of rotation, but mainly we see air moving in, okay? So hopefully that will help for, uh, and we'll do this quickly on Friday, okay?